Uh, so once again, apologies for uh, starting this today's uh, colloquium uh, debate, uh, which was completely uh, uh, out of our uh, control, and we had very bad traffic jam, which is typical of Mumbai, uh, just a kilometer away from here, and we were on we were ahead of time. But uh, the whole thing, you know, that is how time expands and compresses. So anyway, with all that, uh, let us uh, get the uh, the event going. Uh, so I want to welcome on behalf of the Asset uh, Forum and also the CASI 2022 this to this very special Asset Colloquium uh, by Sir Richard John Roberts and we are very very happy to welcome him on our campus and uh, of course Vidita Vaidya is going to formally introduce but I may I request um, Sir Richard Roberts and Director TIFR Jadam. Um, Vidita, as well as Professor Vivek Polshetia, to come on the stage, please. Thank you. Uh, so, may I request uh, Professor Jairam Chanur, Director TIFR, to welcome our guests today uh, with flowers. May I also request Jairam to say a few words of welcome. So friends, um, it's a great uh, pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Nobel laureate Sir Richard uh, to TIFR. We're shortly going to have a very detailed introduction to Sir Richard and his work, so I will not actually attempt to summarize it now. I just wanted to um, say, as probably all of you are aware from reading the abstract, that his journey to the Nobel Prize has been an unusual and interesting one. And it is, in fact, uh, the topic of his talk today. I'm sure you'll all find it extremely fascinating. So with that, I'll stop my brief uh, remarks and just reiterate once again uh, our welcome to Sir Richard. Thank you.
Thank you, Madam. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the CASI 2022 is uh, co-hosting also this special colloquium. So may I request uh, Professor Vivek to say a few words about the conference itself uh, before I can invite uh, Vidita. Yes, good morning, everyone. So I like to welcome you all on behalf of the uh, CACI conference, which we are starting today. And uh, so CACI is all about uh, finding the new materials, which will which will help us to combat the climate change by harvesting solar energy and then converting the CO2 as a useful chemical. So uh, hopefully next five days, we will learn more about it. And I think it's a great start that today we have this uh, uh, lecture by Nobel laureate about uh, how to win the Nobel Prize. Thank you. Thanks, Vivek, for that heads up. Uh, may I now request Professor Vidita Vaidya to formally introduce today's speaker. Morning, everyone, and it's an absolute pleasure on behalf of TIFR to welcome Sir Rich Roberts to our campus on the southernmost tip of Mumbai. We had a rather eventful journey getting here. And that was also an uh, introduction to the city of Mumbai, in a sense. So, Sir Roberts is, um, is a Nobel laureate, a fellow of the Royal Society, a member of the um, European Molecular Biology Organization. Um, he's going to tell you about his journey to the Nobel Prize. So, I'm only going to give you a little bit of some of the introduction. I don't want to steal the thunder and the wonderful talk that's coming shortly. He is a chemist by training, and that's why he is the absolute appropriate person to be giving this introductory joint asset Kaki 2022 talk, given that it is a chemistry conference that's going to be following very shortly. His PhD was done at the University of Sheffield, and it was on photo, uh, so phytochemicals, isoflavonoids, and actually that, that would be something that he may or may, or may not touch upon in great length. He then switched over eventually to uh, molecular biology, was at Cold Spring Harbor Labs after postdoc at Harvard, where he was invited to CSHL by James Watson. So of course, another famous Nobel laureate for the discovery of the structure of DNA along with Francis Crick. Um, it, um, it's, it's amazing what the insights from um, so Richard Roberts' findings have meant to molecular biology, the idea of the genes which generate mRNA to eventually give us proteins, the workhorses of, of our body, the eukaryotic genes actually undergo gene splicing and that there are intronic and exonic segments to genes, giving you the possibility to get a substantial variation as well from a single gene. And that's something that, that really has shaped and changed molecular biology as we understand it. Since the 1990s, since 1992, he has been at Union Biolabs and there's a molecular biologist in this audience. They will know pretty much every one of them would use a restriction enzyme acquired from New England Biolabs at some stage in their career. So that's also a really interesting journey of how he went from academia to New England Biolabs, and I hope he does touch upon that. I also want to tell you that I had this morning the privilege of listening to Sir Robert's sense of humor. So the reason why we got so late it's because an uh, electric university bus decided to take a turning at a very interesting turning radius and then got its steering wheel stuck. It got its steering wheel stuck and went into a steering lock and also needed to power powered up because it couldn't by pushing. And so we were stuck behind this bus and it said on it zero emission. And he said maybe they should switch it over to me calling it zero transmission. So I, was, I had the pleasure of listening to this sense of humor this morning, and I'm looking forward to this talk. And so I'll hand over to Sir Roberts. Oh, yes. So I can change the slides myself, can I? Yes. Okay. So I can put it in presenter mode. Yes. It's not presenter mode. It's not presenter mode. So, Michael. Let me see properly. 
What do you want to do? Escape? No. I'm trying to find out how I can put it in presenter mode. Mm -hmm. That's the first slide. You can come here. Yeah, it is here, but it is going to duplicate also. It's into my put, so I'm not saying at the side. I think if you go to more, maybe I'm going to change it. Sorry about the slight technical problems here. Yeah, well, maybe. Okay, good. Now we uh, we're all set here. So, what I'm going to try and do today is to give you some idea of my background, my career, how I got interested in science. And along the way, I'm hoping to give you a few tips on things that have been very important for me, and which perhaps will be important for you too. So this, these little pictures on here are really there to show you that I love bacteria. Um, I'm hugging bacteria. I have talks I give sometimes about how I love bacteria. And they're much misrepresented. We often think of bacteria just in terms of disease. But in fact, without bacteria, we could not live. So it's really important that we um, acknowledge how important they are to us. Does this? Just hmm? Yeah. OK, so if we look at this slide on the left hand side, it shows this A in the start right in the middle of the country in the town of Derby, where I was born in 1943. And I was really lucky. Um, where I lived was on the direct flight path between Germany and the Rolls-Royce factory that was building all of the engines for the RAF during the war. And so the Germans were constantly trying to bomb it. But at the time, they were not really very accurate. And one side of the street on which I lived was essentially destroyed by the bombs, but fortunately, not my side. And I think this turned out to be very lucky and something that I will refer to during the course of my talk about just how important luck is. We often tend to think that you know, luck is something that is, is irrelevant to our careers, but in fact, I, at the end, will suggest you all take a look and see at what point your career has depended on luck. On the right hand side is um, a picture of the southwest part of England, a town called Bath, where I moved with my parents when I was four years old. And I really grew up in Bath. I, I didn't know very much about Derby. I was too young to really appreciate it at the time. Oh, what do I do? Okay. 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 Hmm? What's happened now? Not blank. This one. Or this button. Hold back. Oh, okay. But this is pointing. It's very, very confusing. Only three buttons. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, I guess I'm easily confused. So when I was um, in Bath and about, oh, eight years old, seven, eight years old, I went to this school, St. Stephen's School, and something rather interesting happened there. Um, when I used to leave in the evening, um, the headmaster, a man called Mr. Brooks, 
used to give me puzzles sometimes, and they were all mathematical puzzles. And I used to take them home and do them, and I just loved doing these puzzles. And I really fell in love with mathematics as a result of that. And I didn't find out until much later that he wasn't doing this to everybody. Somehow he decided that I was the person he wanted to foster in this way and really made a big difference in my life because mathematics has played a very important role through my life. I originally thought I was going to be a professional mathematician. Um, I'm kind of glad I didn't because I'm told that it's very easy when you're a mathematician to sort of reach your limit. Um, and that can be a problem sometimes. Anyway, this was very nice, a small school. After that, I, this is the, some pictures from the town. These are the Roman baths. The town was built in Roman times because of hot springs. So very nice baths, beautiful Georgian architecture here. But when I was about 11, 10, 11, I read a book called How I Became a Detective. And this book was just describing someone who had started off as a regular kind of person and had become a detective. And the idea of solving mysteries really appealed to me. I thought this sounded wonderful. And I was pretty convinced that I was not going to be a mathematician, but I was going to be a detective. But then my father bought me a chemistry set, one of these you know, sets. It's got a few chemicals and test tubes and so on. And unlike the ones that you buy today, where the government has decided you can't do anything really interesting with them, in this one, there were a lot of interesting chemicals. And I learned how to make fireworks and explosives. And that was enough to make me fall in love with chemistry. So really at heart, I'm a chemist, just like many of you. Um, this was organic chemistry. Uh, but later on, I went to City of Bath Boys School as a grammar school. Um, learned a lot more about chemistry, and eventually I went to Sheffield University, where I took, first of all, whole chemistry, and then as a PhD, I took organic chemistry. And so I've had my fair share of chemistry, one way and another. I also did a number of other things when I was in high school. Um, we lived very close to a limestone escarpment called the Mendip Hills, and I used to spend a lot of time underground. And I loved going under and sort of going down the passages that people didn't really know where they went. And this idea of exploring kind of fell in with the idea of being a detective. And now, of course, it's fallen in line with the idea of being a research scientist. Also loved jazz, Bath had a very good jazz festival. Now, this was Sheffield University. And when I went there, I really... Or I, I thought I might become an industrial chemist. That was kind of in my mind. But I just wanted to, to learn as much as I could about chemistry. And later, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I got a 2-1. I didn't get a first-class degree. I got a 2-1. Uh, but nevertheless, I really did. I thought I did quite well in chemistry. I was very happy. And the head of department, Professor Ollis, um, asked me if I would be a graduate student with him. And so I did, and I went and became a graduate student. But the interesting thing about that was that I had not a lot of interactions with him. I'd actually had more interactions as an undergraduate. But when I became a graduate student, the person who had the most influence on me um, was this gentleman, Kazu Kurosawa. This is a, a relatively recent picture. It was taken about five years ago um, when I met him in Japan. But when I was in the lab, he was a postdoc, and he taught me more about chemistry than anybody. I, I never heard more. He was a great teacher. He would explain to you what you should do, why you were doing it, and most of the time the experiments worked, but you came away knowing why they worked. And I think this is really very valuable to have this kind of education and to find a mentor who can do that sort of thing for you. And so Kazu was really wonderful. He also taught me how to play Go, um, this game down here. Of course, not as well as AlphaGo, but nevertheless, I learned to play Go. I love to play Go. And in fact, for many years, no non-Japanese ever beat me at Go. He also taught me how to play Shogi, which is the Japanese form of chess. Uh, but chess is more interesting. But thanks to Kazu, by the end of my first year as a graduate student, I had everything that I needed in order to write my thesis. I could easily have written my thesis at that time. 
But of course, in England, there was a certain amount of bureaucracy. And so you had to spend three years doing an undergraduate degree. So the second year, I sort of did a few experiments that I thought might be interesting and nothing much happened. And then I started to go over to the library and I read a lot about this subject called molecular biology. And in the process, I read this book called The Thread of Life by John Kendrew. Kendrew was a Nobel laureate who did the, one of the first protein structures. And in it, he described how molecular biology had come about from people who were interested in the way in which biology worked, but really from a chemical standpoint. Um, and so this became known as molecular biology. And by the time I finished that book, just like with a detective book, now I wanted to be a molecular biologist. And one of the things I would say is it's always worth reading stuff outside of your subject, but technical stuff, but stuff outside of your subject. Um, because you never know when you come across something that is so much more interesting and so much more fascinating than what you're doing at the moment. And I've always felt if I come across that, I'm going to start doing it. I'll change. I, I, I don't mind changing completely. So when it came time to do a postdoc, I applied to six labs who were all doing molecular biology, but really from a more of a chemical point of view than anything else. But nevertheless, um, I made the applications. Five of them turned me down, and one person accepted me. And that person was Jack Strominger, who at the time was at Wisconsin. And so he said, fine, come along, and you know, I'll give you a salary, and you can come and do your thing. It sounded good. But a couple of months before I was scheduled to go, he called me and said, could you just delay coming, because I'm about to move to Harvard. And so he went to Harvard. I joined him there. And so quite by chance, instead of going to Wisconsin, which was uh, the, the University of Wisconsin at Madison was a good place, but it wasn't Harvard. Harvard is obviously a lot better. And so by chance, I ended up at Harvard. And the problem I had was to look at a tRNA, a transfer RNA, that normally transfers an amino acid into a protein, into a growing protein. But in Staphylococcus epidermidis, there was a lot of glycine in the cell wall. So the basic wall around the bacterium had crosslinks that contained chains of glycine and serine. And Staphylococcus aureus also had something, but just glycine. And in both of these bugs, there was a tRNA that was specific for putting the glycine into the cell wall. And the question, and it didn't work in, in uh, protein synthesis, the question was, why didn't it work in protein synthesis? And so the obvious way to answer that was to look at the sequence and see if there was something um, interesting about it. And I picked up the project from a previous postdoc called Tom Stewart, who left after I'd been there for about six months and went to Australia. And he had been using uh, what I would call an old fashioned method of looking at the sequence of RNA. And there had been quite a lot of work done on it. Uh, but nevertheless, I read about Fred Sanger, who had a different way of looking at sequencing RNA. And this was to use P32 labeled RNA. And then there were a lot of experiments you could do. And it was just a totally different approach, but it was much faster and promised to be more elegant. And so I wrote to Fred and I said, could I come and work in your lab and learn how to sequence um, RNA? And Fred is shown here. Fred is in many ways my hero. He's the person I would like to most emulate in science. He was a very humble man, won two Nobel Prizes um, for sequencing proteins, figuring out how to sequence proteins, and then for DNA. He could also have won one for RNA because he was the guy who figured out how to sequence RNA. But anyway, they don't, the Nobel Committee doesn't like to give the prize to people twice if they can avoid it. But in this case, they had no choice. And so um, he got it twice. And he was a very humble man. The first time I met him, I went to um, his lab on a Sunday morning and because I'd just come in from the States. And I went to sort of see what was going on. And there was this little old man sitting, well, actually standing, washing glassware in the lab. And you know, I went and I said, oh, my name is Rich Roberts. I'm uh, here to work with Fred Sanger. And he looked at me and said, oh, I'm Fred Sanger. And I, would, I thought he was a janitor. I, I had absolutely no idea. And 
you know, he already had a Nobel Prize at that time. Anyway, so that turned out to be very interesting. But what happened as a result of that, I came back to Harvard, set up RNA sequencing using his methods, and I was the first person in the Boston area to be doing that. And everybody came to me to learn how to do it, including Wally Gilbert's, this is Wally Gilbert, including his technician. And so, and we also provided some oligonucleotides for, for Wally so that he could do the work he was doing on the LAC operator. So that turned out to be very nice. And I was approached one day by a guy called Mark Potashny, who had been working on bacteriophage lambda and control of the um, replication there. And so he came and he said, well, you know, Jim Watson, I think, um, is going to come and see you and offer you a job at Cold Spring Harbor because he wants someone to sequence SV40 DNA. And at the time, the only way you could sequence DNA was by copying it into RNA and then sequencing the RNA. And so I said, oh, you know, that sounds nice. And I waited and I waited and no sign of Jim. And so Mark, one day, a couple of weeks later, comes up and he says, well, Jim doesn't actually know who you are. Uh, perhaps you could go and introduce yourself. So obviously, Jim had heard about me through Mark. So I was in his office for about 10 minutes, during which time he told me that I had a job at Cold Spring Harbor. He wanted to hire me. Um, and I was just leaving the office and he said, oh, then you should probably come down and visit, uh, but you've got the job, don't worry, just come down and visit. And so I ended up at, SV, at um, Cold Spring Harbor. But when I got there, I discovered there were two groups already sequencing SV40 using RNA methods. And that didn't sound as though it was very interesting. Why would you wanna be a third person doing the same thing that two other groups were doing? Uh, but fortunately, just before I left Harvard, I'd gone and listened to a talk by Dan Nathans, this gentleman here, who, together with Werner Arbor and Ham Smith, had won the prize, the Nobel Prize, for discovering restriction enzymes. And the key enzyme was actually one that Ham Smith discovered. At the time, it was called endonuclease R. It was actually a mixture of two enzymes. Um, but because of the substrate he was using, this enzyme only cut one, only one of the enzymes cut the DNA. And Dan Nathans had been using it to map SV40, to cut SV40 into pieces and see what was going on. And one of the reasons that RNA sequencing was developed before DNA sequencing is that there were really no small DNA fragments to practice on. But the restriction enzymes gave you the opportunity of getting small fragments of DNA and then hopefully developing methods to do things. And so I thought, well, I'd heard at the time when I went to Cold Spring Harbor, <coughs> IndyR had been discovered two years previously. There were two or three more that had been discovered in the meantime, and I quickly made them. And then I thought, well, let's go look for some more. And everywhere we looked, we found these things, and they were all different. They all recognized different sequences. And it occurred to me that perhaps we could use these as a way to sequence DNA. That is, by mapping all the restriction fragments, maybe we could map DNA. Um, that turned out not to work, um, but the restriction enzymes were so interesting themselves and everybody wanted them. And so people used to come to Cold Spring Harbor meetings and they'd have a, a tube of DNA in their pocket and they'd come down to my lab and say, do you have an enzyme that will cut this? And so we kind of set up a little shop uh, where they could come down and see what was going on. And then, of course, once they found the one they were interested in, they said, oh, could I have a little sample of that? Because these weren't commercially available. They were only available in my lab at the time. I think of the first 100 enzymes discovered, 75 were discovered in my lab. So we were kind of the monopoly on this. And then some people said, well, you know, but we'll make it ourselves, give us the strain. And so we gave the strain. But it was clear that there was a business here. Here was a way... Um, that one could actually use restriction enzymes as a product. And I suggested to Jim Watson, he set up a company at Cold Spring Harbor where we could sell these restriction enzymes and then use the profits to support the research at Cold Spring Harbor. Seemed to me like a perfectly reasonable idea. Well, Jim Watson, in his wisdom, said, um, no, you know, that's no good. It's kind of dirty to be associated with industry. He wasn't very commercially minded. And also he said, I don't think you can make any money doing that. And so I looked around because I, I knew both people wanted them and you could make money at it. 
And eventually ran into a gentleman called Don Combe, who was at New England Biolab. Uh, well, actually, he was at um, Biolab. He just called the company Biolabs at the time. There was he, his wife, and one technician. And I called him and told him what we had. And he said he was interested in making a couple of these enzymes, and he was going to sell them through a distributor. And I convinced him that that wasn't necessary because I could tell him exactly which enzymes people wanted. I could give him a list of addresses and names of people who would buy them. And I said, you should just do it yourself. You know, it's really easy to do. And so that's what he did. And he offered me a partnership in the business, but I didn't really want to be a partner. I was still at the early stage of an academic career. And so I said, well, look, I'll just be your chief consultant. And so starting in 1975, I think it was March 75, I became his chief consultant. And we had an interesting arrangement. Um, he wanted to pay me some money for every enzyme um, that was sold. And he said, well, I'll give you 10% of, of the price. And he had thought about selling the enzymes for $40 in a test tube. And he raised the price to 44, four for me and 40 for him. And so that worked out well. But after two years, it was just too much money. It, it was ridiculous. And so I suggested to him he should pay a little less. And we dropped it to 1%. And then that got to be too much. And then we just settled for a standard sum each year. I've never really been interested in money. Um, I, I love science. And I found that um, science has always paid very well, either with a job or with other things or speaking fees or whatever. So. But money doesn't drive me, science drives me. Now, when Jim Watson discovered that I wasn't going to be sequencing SV40 DNA um, using the, his, his method, he got really annoyed with me. And he, he was constantly um, threatening to fire me. He said, you know, you just don't do anything you're told. You go off and do all this stuff. That's not why we hired you. And he, he didn't realize that what I was doing was actually really important and useful. It was the start of the biotech industry in many ways. It allowed people to make recombinant DNAs, and there were just loads of things they could do. But Jim had a very good friend called Norton Zinder, shown here. Um, and he used to, and he and I became good friends, and he used to talk to Jim every time he wanted to fire me and convince him that he shouldn't. So Norton played a very important role in my life, I have to say. Now, when we first had the restriction enzymes, we wanted to use them um, ourselves, and we were interested in adenovirus DNA. And I had a postdoc, Richard Gelina, shown here, who came to my lab. I'd met him at Harvard, and he came and said he wanted to be a postdoc. And so we started off using some enzymes to actually map um, adenovirus DNA. And that's the only paper I ever had with Phil Sharp, who eventually I shared the Nobel Prize with. And at Cold Spring Harbor, people were looking at transcription, how the RNAs were being made from SV40 DNA, from uh, adenovirus DNA. And we thought it would be really good to ask whether the promoter, that is the sequence in the DNA that tells the RNA polymerase where it should start making message, um, where it starts. Is the sequence the same as it is in bacteria? Because a couple of people had figured out how it worked in bacteria, what the sequences were, but no one knew for an, a eukaryotic virus um, what was going on. Adenovirus grows in human cells, I should add. So it, it's very much eukaryotic. And so we had this idea that we would start um, and look for the very ends, the terminal oligonucleotide, the terminal string of nucleotides on the messenger RNA for the E1A transcript and the E4 transcript. These come in from the ends of adenovirus DNA. And we thought that we could then find sequences, just a short oligo sequence, sequence the DNA, and then see where the RNA sequence was. And then just upstream would be this promoter sequence that, that we were hoping for. And so Richard got started on this, I think probably about 1975, mid-75. And we did an experiment, and we couldn't get enough RNA to really do it properly. And so then we turned to late RNA. Oh, sorry, did I go over? Oh, maybe I missed that slide. Um, late during adenovirus infection, 
there's a lot of RNA is made all the way across here. And, but it, it, we didn't know, you know, you, it's not a case where you could sequence in from the end and hope to get there. And it, we just started and did the whole thing differently. And the idea of getting the ends of RNA was to use an enzyme called ribonuclease T1. It cuts after all the G residues. And so you get three kinds of oligonucleotides. You get this one, which is from the five prime end, the triphosphate. Here, just GP, the string of nucleotides, and then GP. And at the three prime end in eukaryotes, there's an enzyme that adds A, a whole string of A residues. And so the three prime nucleotide, the three prime oligo would be poly A. And there was an easy way to get rid of that. And so the secret was how would we find this? How would we separate it? Well, it turns out that just while we were doing this in 1976, early 76, two groups discovered that there was something special about the five prime end of eukaryotic messenger RNA. And they had this really weird structure, a G cap that was present joined to the triphosphate that then went on. And in bacteria, you just have the triphosphate, but in higher organisms, in eukaryotes, you have this cap structure. And because it was oriented the way it was chemically linked um, to the triphosphate, it had a dihydroxyl group here. And that gave us a key uh, of, we actually developed a method where we could capture this specifically on a boron column, boron hydride column. And so we had the way of separating out the capped oligonucleotides. And so we were expecting that what would happen um, would be that we would find the cap structure. These are the late RNAs up here. And so it looks as though there's maybe a dozen, maybe 15 of them. We didn't know for sure, but we were expecting there would be a different oligonucleotide at the five prime end of each of these. And so there was a way that was developed that Fred Sanger had developed a long time ago to separate out all these oligonucleotides. And so we were expecting that when we did the experiment uh, and Richard Gelinas did the experiment, that we would get a two-dimensional spread showing 15, 12, 15 different spots. But instead, what happened, we discovered that there were two spots here that later we figured out were actually related because one was a cyclic form of the other. Uh, but usually we just got this one spot. And that said that all of these 12, 15 RNAs all had exactly the same five prime end. Now, we happen to know that there were no repeated sequences of that sort in adenovirus. And so the question was, what was going on? Well, my first thought was, you know, I'd come up with this great experiment and Richard just hadn't done it properly. And so I said, you know, well, do it a couple of times. And he did. And I said, well, let me do it. And I'll show you how to do it properly. And I got the same results. So of course, at that point, you believe it. And so we were convinced that there was something going on here um, that just didn't fit in with what was in the textbooks. It didn't fit in with the current dogma. And you know, when you're doing science and you're doing research, this is the best thing that can happen. Failure is terrific. If you can show that you failed, not because you screwed up, but rather because nature is trying to tell you something, you know there's a discovery there. Maybe only a small one, but occasionally it's a big one. Uh, and this turned out to be a big one. So we set about doing this. We did an awful lot of work to, well, first of all, this was the experiment, a, a predominant 11 long nucleotide on late adenovirus messenger RNAs. And then we did a whole series of experiments looking hybridization to end So you can take the RNA, you can hybridize it to the individual DNA fragments that should be coding for it. And every, no matter which fragment we found, we always found this cap structure. But then something a little strange um, happened. When the hybridized, when the mRNA was hybridized to the main coding region, which we already knew where that was because of some mapping experiments that others had done, and then just treat it gently with ribonuclease to get rid of any RNA that wasn't nicely hybridized, we lost the cap structure. And so this said that the cap structure, this oligonucleotide at the five prime end, wasn't coded immediately adjacent to the main message. And this turned out to be the key. And so we now had to figure out how we were going to show 
where this five prime oligonucleotide came from. And so we sort of visualize, this was what it was like. Here's the DNA, here's the RNA. At the three prime end, there's this poly A, which is not coded. And then at the five prime end, there must be something else. There must be a five prime end that was coded somewhere else. And you can make things called R loops. So if you mix RNA and DNA and heat it up slightly, the DNA melts and the RNA will hybridize to the strand that is coding it. And RNA-DNA hybrids are more stable than DNA hybrids. And so you can get these R loops, so-called. And we thought, well, if we can find a probe, something that will tell us that will hybridize to this, then we should be able to work out um, what is going on. So this is the idea. You do the R loop, add the DNA probe. And I had an idea in my head of where it was being coded. And so we did the experiment, or at least I should say, Tom Broker and Louise Chow did the experiment uh, because neither Richard nor I were electron microscopists. And so I came up with this experiment on a Saturday morning because Richard and I always used to be going through and deciding why last week's experiments hadn't worked and what the next one should be. And so we went and talked to Tom and Louise and they said, um, well, you know, no one's quite done this experiment before, but it should be okay. And they did the experiment and we were expecting they were going to see a structure like this, but instead what they see was a structure like this. So this piece at the five prime end of adenovirus was not just coding to a single place, it was actually coding at two places. So the typical adenovirus messenger RNA at this point had three separate segments associated with it. And so the question became how, how this was all possible, but the experiment was so successful, it was done in the morning and by the afternoon, everybody was talking about Nobel prizes because it was clear that something quite remarkable, no one had predicted it, nobody had even guessed what was going on. And all of a sudden we had evidence for a brand new phenomenon in nature. And so that was all terribly exciting. This was the paper called An Amazing Sequence Arrangement of the Five Prime Ends of Adenovirus Messenger RNAs. We had three referees. The referees, each one of them said, it is inappropriate to use the word amazing in the title of a paper. Sounds sort of magical, you shouldn't be doing this. And so I called the editor, we, there were a number of other comments too. So I called the editor and I was talking about all the other things and we were having a nice conversation. And I just mentioned, you know, when you first heard about this, what did you think? He said it was amazing. Well, I said, I rest my case. And so that's why amazing ended up in the title. And I'm told it's the first time it was ever used in the title of a, a scientific paper. So that was kind of exciting too. We then went on and did a bunch of other things. We sequenced some splice junctions. Um, we sequenced the whole of adenovirus to DNA. Um, we pioneered DNA sequence assembly programs because when we were sequencing adenovirus DNA, it comes out in little pieces. You would just get in little pieces here and there. You have to work out how they all overlap and join together. And then we began developing bioinformatics. And so that's how I got involved in what I spend all of my time doing today, which is basically bioinformatics looking at DNA sequences and then trying to figure out what the information means and how it relates to biology. In 1993, got the Nobel Prize shared with Phil Sharp. Um, that was really very exciting. And I have to say, going to Sweden to pick up the Nobel Prize is a very special experience. It's something I recommend to everybody. It really is good. Um, the Swedes really know how to throw a party. And the most difficult thing is to stay sober for any length of time because lunch, dinner, there was so much champagne flowing. It was quite incredible. So, but it was good. It, it was very good. But actually, I've got to say it was nice when it was over. Now, one of the things you have to do when you go to Stockholm and pick up a Nobel Prize is you have to give a Nobel lecture. Most everybody talks about all the wonderful work they've done based on their discovery. But I hadn't done very much because the, the, the experiments we really wanted to do, um, there was another lab, Tom, Tom Maniaris up at Harvard, who had actually found a better system 
to do what we were trying to do. And so we weren't very successful at that. And so we tried it for two or three years and then gave up and started doing other things. And I started to get very interested in DNA methylation. Um, what happens to DNA, it gets modified very often, in particular in bacteria, um, to protect against restriction enzymes. And we tried for several years to get a structure for a, a DNA methylase out of a bacterium. And just before I had to go to Stockholm, we discovered this. And this is that when the DNA methylase, shown here in the um, gray structure, when it binds to the DNA, it flips the base that is in the DNA right out of the helix and into a little pocket in the enzyme where the chemistry takes place. And it turns out that there are an awful lot of enzymes that do chemistry on DNA that use exactly the same kind of catalytic mechanism. They flip the base right out of the DNA and then do the chemistry on it. And so this was very nice. I used this as the basis for my talk in Stockholm. And I have to say, if, if you've got to give a talk in Stockholm before um, the Nobel crowd, it's good to have a new discovery to tell them about. Now, let me just take a little talk now about New England Biolabs. So it, New England Biolabs had been very successful from the very start. We were actually profitable every year from 1975 onwards. In 1992, I was getting fed up at Cold Spring Harbor. I used to fight with Jim Watson all the time, and it just wasn't pleasant to be with him for too long. And I'd been spent six years as assistant director in which I had to interact with him almost every day. And so I thought I was going to start a company to sequence DNA because I thought this was getting quite exciting, the human genome project people were talking about and so on. And there were several places, um, several academics who had ideas for sequencing. And so I was talking to Don Combe at Biolabs one day, and he said, well, you know, if you're going to go to industry, you should come to us. And so he made me a nice offer, and I decided that was the thing I should do. And then I regretted not having done it six years earlier when I became assistant director to Jim Watson. And so I, I've really had a wonderful time. Biolabs is a very interesting company. It has a very different business model. And it's based a lot on the fact that we're a private company. And so the model that I had originally envisioned for Cold Spring Harbor was that we would use the profits to support research. And it turned out that Don Cohn, who had previously been associate professor at Harvard Medical School, had exactly the same idea. So he too wanted to use the profits to support research. And at the moment, we're now a company of about 650 people worldwide. We have 350 in Ipswich and 100, a little over 100 of those are doing research, most of it basic and all paid for by the company profits. So it's beautiful. If I, if I want to buy a, a DNA sequencer, I write a purchase order, send it in, and within a few weeks, it comes. It's just a, no bureaucracy, no grant writing. It's wonderful. I, I recommend it to everybody. But you, you have to realize that you have to stay as a private company in order to do this. You can't do this as a public company because as soon as people start buying shares in your company, they want to take the profits. They don't want you to spend the profits on research, and they have no interest in research on the whole. And so we can only get away with this as long as we're, we're private. And we have no intention of changing from that. We're also a profit sharing company. And so at the end of the year, any profits that have not been spent on research or just running the company, we share out equally among all the employees. What have we done at Biolabs? So um, since I moved up there, um, we started, well, actually this had begun before I got there. Um, but we did quite a lot of cloning of all the restriction enzymes to make it easier to make them so that you can um, really do a good job in terms of ensuring good quality control. Um, we've been doing a lot of bioinformatics. I say these days, almost everything I do is bioinformatics. And then we did a lot of genome sequencing and then using methods to find the restriction enzyme genes. And of course, as I said before, these restriction enzymes protect against uh, phages that are coming in. 
And so one of the things that happens is they have a companion methylase that methylates the recognition site to save the bacteria from dying. And so what we've found, we've actually been concentrating on the methylases because in many ways they turn out to be more interesting biologically than the restriction enzymes. And so many solitary methylases are found in bacteria. That is, they don't have a companion restriction enzyme gene. And so the question is, what are they doing? Why are they there? There's also a lot more variability in recognition sequences than we expected. The type two methylases, the ones that are used to protect enzymes like the one that Ham Smith first discovered back in 1970, um, the specificity of the methylase usually matches that of the restriction enzyme, but not always. Sometimes it's a little more degenerate and recognize additional sequences. And there've been many non-specific methylases, things that just methylate A or methylate C have been found on bacteriophages, where the bacteriophages are trying to protect their DNA against the restriction enzyme in the bacterium they're trying to infect. And so that's turned out to be uh, pretty interesting too. We have been using a sequencing technique developed by Pacific Biosciences. And the beauty of this method is that it gives you methylase recognition sequences very easily. The functional annotation of methylase genes then becomes really straightforward. Closing bacterial genomes is really easily done because PacBio gives you very long reads. And so it's easy to assemble the pieces. And that's also a more accurate sequencing method. And so that's turned out to be really useful. And we've published a lot of work in this area. We're still developing algorithms um, to understand the signals that come from PAC biosequencing, but it, it's made a huge difference to our ability, my ability to do research. I wanna tell you a little about other things um, that I do. You know, When you win the Nobel Prize, there's a bunch of things that happen. Um, one of the things was I was asked to become a stud muffin of science. This, this was me here. And there was a group in Cambridge who put out a calendar every year of sort of what people they thought were good looking scientists. And I became Dr. December one year, um, shown here in 1997. I also used the money from my Nobel Prize to put a croquet lawn in front of my house. I love playing croquet. And so that's paid off really well and has been very nice. And what I like about it is it combines um, sort of chess and snooker. And I, as a kid, I thought I was going to be thrown out of school at one point. And I went to audition to be a professional snooker player, um, partly because I was the West of England junior snooker champion at the time. And Joe Davis, who was the world champion, was looking for a sparring partner, someone that he could take around, who he could definitely beat, but would at least give him a good game. So I went to audition for that, but then the headmaster relented and said, well, we're not going to throw you out of school after all. And so that turned out to be rather good. I've also had quite a lot of um, honors that have come my way. I might say the Nobel Prize was the first prize I ever won. I, I never had one before that. I was knighted by Prince Charles, now King Charles, and I was rather glad that his hand didn't shake when he was uh, holding the sword, because at the time he was still a little old, and well, anyway, let's, let's not go too far into that. Um, I had a couple of buildings named after me. There was a big expansion of the chemistry department in Sheffield, chemistry, and this was very good. I was knighted in 2008, but one of the things I'm most proud about is that I discovered something after I won the Nobel Prize. Before I won it, I had lots of opinions about things and I would tell people of these opinions and sometimes they'd listen, but you know, lots of times they just blew me away and certainly never acted on anything that I said. After I won the Nobel Prize, people started to listen just as you're listening to me now. And a lot of people all of a sudden decided, well, maybe what I was saying was worth listening to and they should follow through. And I got a, a whole series of campaigns organized in which I got my fellow Nobel laureates to support me, sign letters and do things. And one of the big early successes was getting some nurses out of jail. They were on death row in Libya 
having been accused of spreading HIV in the children's hospital in Benghazi, with something like 400 kids who got HIV, they became infected by HIV. But it was clear that the problem was not that these nurses had come and deliberately done it, but rather that the standard practice in Libyan hospitals was to reuse needles. So if you're vaccinating people or if you're taking blood samples, they just kept using the same needle. One person came to the hospital who was infected and then it spread through all these kids. And I organized the Nobel laureates to get involved in this and we got about 120 signatures. I called the Foreign Office in London uh, because they were one of the few governments that actually had diplomatic relations with Libya. The US didn't have any at the time. And the person I spoke to was quite helpful that this was off their radar. They weren't gonna do anything, but after I expressed an interest and told them what we're doing, um, they were very helpful in dealing with the Libyans. I also went down to the UN and spoke to the Libyan ambassador to the UN and had a long conversation with him and I gave him a letter and he passed it on to Gaddafi. And a couple of weeks later, Gaddafi's son wrote to me, no, called me, and he said, would you come to Tripoli and talk to us about this? So I hop on a plane, go to Tripoli and talk to him. And at the end of about a half hour conversation, he said, well, you know, we know they're not really guilty. We're gonna let them go. And so they got off death row as a result of this. And so, I, I was very grateful. I thought this was really a good thing. And so I've done a number of other um, humanitarian causes of one sort and another. Um, none have been as successful as that, but some of them have been quite successful. So what I try to do is I pick causes that have good humanitarian aims or try to get over the misuse of science. People are sort of telling lies about science. And I think this is something that I feel extremely strongly about. Um, and so one of the things is shown here, this is a, a GMO campaign, a pro GMO campaign, because there is so much misinformation being spread around about how dangerous GMOs are. And it's just not true. And unfortunately, you have a lady here, Vandana Shiva, who has been going around just basically telling lies about GMOs to scare people. And one of the problems is as soon as you scare people, it's very difficult to reassure them that everything is actually okay. And so this is sort of the typical anti-GMO stand um, where people are going around and saying, you know, this stuff's really dangerous. Do you know what it can do for you? But for the young people in Africa who are, go to bed hungry every night, they say, yes, I know it can keep me alive. And I think we have to remember that when we do things in the developed world, and say things that are not true, that it can have severe consequences for the developing world. And this has been true in India, although I just learned today that a GM crop has been approved. You've been growing GM cotton here for a long time, but there has been a strong anti-GMO feeling here. I actually spoke to Prime Minister Modi about this on two occasions. I was hoping to have some effect, but um, whether or not he's really changed his mind, I don't know. Uh, but we're trying to really do something here and get this going. And now before I close, just want to tell you um, something that I've learned and it concerns luck. So I was playing snooker one time um, in a championship game, hit the ball and I was trying to pop the ball in one pocket and I missed that, but uh, another ball went in and I was able to continue the break. But the next shot that I took, I fluffed it. I really wasn't paying proper attention. And at the end of the game, an old man came up to me. I was 17 at the time. An old man came up to me and said, you know, when you have a piece of luck, as you did in that game, you have to concentrate twice as hard on the next shot to make sure you take advantage of it. Okay? Don't let it go away. Don't feel guilty because you had the luck and someone else didn't because every one of you in this room has a lot of luck. And if you go back and look through your lives, you'll see just where luck has taken you, um, that perhaps things happened because of luck, not because you were driving them. So, oh, sorry. Um, Kazu Kurosawa, the Japanese mentor that I had in Sheffield, who would have known that he was going to really influence my life and teach me how to do science in such a positive way? I ended up at Harvard instead of Wisconsin. 
We started looking for eukaryotic promoters in adenovirus. They could have been exactly like promoters in bacteria. Who knew? And yet here we are making one of the big discoveries in molecular biology, pure luck. One thing I want to tell you about is taking an early plane. Many of you probably have remember, heard about um, the plane that went into one of the World Trade Towers in um, 2001, 9-11. Well, the plane, the first plane that went into that tower, I was booked on that until two weeks before it took off. And I was going to a conference in California and they moved the date of the conference one day earlier. And so I ended up taking that plane one day before the one that went into the World Trade Tower. That is luck. That is incredibly good luck. And I am grateful to this day for that. And finally, studying bacterial restriction modification systems. I started off with restriction enzymes, now I'm onto methylasers, and it has really paid off during my scientific career. I had lots of good papers, lots of interesting stuff we've discovered. And so that's been very, very good and very lucky. I just happened to hear a talk. I heard Dan Nathan's talk, and that started me on that path. Finally, I just want to acknowledge the people who've been important. So Richard Gelinas, Louise Chow, Tom Broker, these were the people who really helped make RNA splicing such a big story. Saida Zain was a, a Pakistani scientist, actually, who worked in my lab for a number of years. And she made some important contributions um, in sort of leading us to devise the right experiments. Dan Klesig was in Ray Jesslin's lab, and he was a graduate student at the time, but looking at individual messengers. And finally, the many members, colleagues, lab members, people, collaborators over the years, and we all depend upon these people. And I feel particularly grateful for everybody that I've run into. They've been great. And finally, my longtime assistant, Karen Otto, who just retired at the end of September, worked with me for 37 years, and she's been just fantastic in making sure that when I come to visit India, I know what route I'm taking and I know the itinerary and she makes lots of my slides and she's just been fantastic. And I'm not quite sure what I'm gonna do without her. And I thank you all for listening. Thank you. I hope you'll be able to take some questions. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, sir Roberts for the Really, really outstanding lecture. Uh, I'm sure there will be many questions uh, from you. So I again invite the visitor to conduct the question answers. Do we have uh, hand microphones for? Yeah, yeah they're all here. Okay, great. Um, I'll let you be here. I will okay. take a Fine. Yes. Something you just put your hand up for a question if there is any. Ah, uh, stunned into silence. <laughs> uh, I was actually going to ask you in terms of where you see the future of genetically modified crops going and just your insight on what you see happening world over now with GM crops, just a little bit of your insight. Sure. Well, I, I think, you know, the we Nobel laureates are really going to push this issue as much as we can. But the real problem at the moment is Europe. So the Europeans got involved in being anti-GMO for all the wrong reasons. Greenpeace were the big group that started it, and they did it as a way of raising money. And it's been their most successful money-raising campaign ever. And when they first started, you might even have excused them a little bit because they said, well, you know, this is very new science. We don't know if there are going to be consequences. We don't know what's going on. We need to do some experiments to find out if these things are safe. Well, you know, some 30 years on, we've done the experiments and they're safe. There's not been a single accident associated with GM crops. And you wouldn't expect them to be because it's a much more precise way of breeding crops and introducing new traits. It offers a number of benefits. It can affect climate change. We can change crops so that they don't put as much CO2 out or even consume CO2 and bury it. We can make them so that they provide more nutrition. Um, golden rice is a good example of that. Golden rice has the genes for vitamin A. It puts the precursor beta carotene into the grain and this can help solve child blindness. You know, there are 
approximately a million children die every year because they go blind, because they don't get enough vitamin A when they're growing up. And yet Greenpeace and the anti-GMO people are against this. And they've gone around the world, not content with doing it in Europe, they've gone around the world doing it. And frankly, this is awful. And I'm really glad that there are some countries now who are starting to realize that this was not a good thing. But the most interesting and optimistic thing I've come across so far is that in France, Champagne doesn't grow Champagne grapes very well anymore. The grapes, because of climate change, just don't grow as well anymore. With genetic modification, that could be altered. And at the moment, many gr growers in Champagne, in the Champagne region, have moved their crops to the southern part of England where the climate is a little better. And so Europe is finally realizing that maybe they are going to need GM crops because you can do very quickly with GM methods things that you can't do with traditional breeding. So I'm hopeful um, that there are signs of change. Uh, this recent thing in India is good. In um, Nigeria, they've recently come up with cowpea, uh, GM cowpea. In Zimbabwe, which were totally opposed to GM crops because of Robert Mugabe, they've been suffering famines there because the corn that they've been growing doesn't grow so well. And in South Africa, they're growing GM corn and it works really well. So the government of Zimbabwe now want to grow um, GM corn in Zimbabwe. And there's, there's a whole bunch of things like this where small um, impact, a, a little impact is coming from a country that decided, well, we'll grow GM this or we'll grow GM that. And it's solving a lot of problems. And I think the nice thing about this is it's where science and scientists in labs in these developing countries can really make the crops that are needed and improve the crops that are needed. The science is getting easier and easier all the time. Don't have to spend a huge amount of money in order to develop these crops. What you have to spend a lot of money on at the moment though, is getting around government regulations, which for the most part are terrible. They're just awful. So. That's something that we, we need to do something about. There's a question there. Hello? So can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you, Professor, for, okay. for uh, sharing us a great journey of yours. So as you said that uh, since, uh, since you born that uh, you had so a uh, lot of luck from the beginning, I just wanted to ask you, could you please share when you end up as a unlucky? <laughs> Any incident? Where Sorry, you I didn't unlucky? quite catch that. Yeah, so can, can you hear me better? No, just, just repeat the last part. Just repeat the last part. The last of part it. that I was asking that you were, you were lucky in many incidents, as you said, since you were born. But I just wanted to ask you that could you please share an incident when you end up as unlucky? <laughs> he wants to know if you remember an incident when you were unlucky. Oh, plenty. <laughs> yes, I mean, you know, everybody has unlucky things happen to them, but I, I like to, I'm an optimist, I like to focus on the lucky things. So, you know, there've been loads of times I've been doing experiments and I was careless when I was putting the reagents together and it didn't work. And then you go back and you keep doing it until you figure out what went wrong. So these things happen. And failure is actually a good thing. I, I think too many people are told by parents or teachers, oh, you're horrible because you failed. This is when you learn. People who don't fail don't learn. Most people who start companies fail the first time around and they learn what went wrong and then they succeed the next time. This happened to Bill Gates and he did okay, right? Yeah, uh, Professor. So, Robert, that was a fantastic talk. So, something sure. I wanted to... Call me Sir Richard. Oh, okay. the, the correct way of addressing English knights is Sir Richard, but I actually prefer it if you just call me Rich. Okay. Uh, so you spoke about uh, the funding in science, especially the organization that you're currently in. So I just wanted uh, to know your insights about the few uh, way science will be funded in the future, because recently there has been a lot of conversations about how exactly science is funded both in academia and outside. And more in particular, I'd like to know your insights on how exactly curiosity driven basic research, which doesn't really have a inherent application right from get go gets funded in the future time because at a time when there is a lot of pressure 
from funding agencies and other grant sources about deriving applications for your work or something of that sort? Yeah, I, I, I think we have a couple of problems on the funding front. One is that certainly in the US, and I also detect this elsewhere, um, there is sort of an anti-science movement taking place. And this is very strong in the US at the moment. And that is going to affect funding unless something is done about it. In the US, it's driven by the Republicans. Um, and if they gain power, then I think we're going to see a lot of science budgets go down. Um, and it, it really is foolish because basic science, which is what I've done all my life, has been incredibly successful. We discovered RNA splicing. It took until about five years ago because, before there was a clinical application of that. And now children who have spinal muscular atrophy um, can be not cured, but they can be kept alive by spotting a splicing defect and then correcting it. And there are a number of cases like this, restriction enzymes. We wouldn't have a biotech industry if we didn't have those. They started the biotech industry and look at how successful that's been. And you don't have to look very far to go back and see how basic science can have a huge impact. When DNA sequencing got going, it led to the Human Genome Project. In the future, precision medicine is going to depend upon being able to sequence human genomes very quickly and recognizing what is wrong and what's gone wrong. Um, in computer science, you know, there are tremendous um, really advances taking place at the moment in artificial intelligence, in using computers to solve problems that we don't easily solve ourselves. Our minds are just not able to do a lot of the things, some things we do really well, but very often AI can be very, very helpful. Of course, it has its downside too. Um, it's often driving social media in directions you may not want it to go. But nevertheless, all of this came about because of basic research and basic understandings, curiosity-driven research, people who wanted to find out what was going on. And I think we just need to make sure we keep making this case um, to the various governments that are putting up money. But I would also say, consider starting a company and using the profits to support whatever research you really want to do. It's not that difficult to do it. But very often the business world makes it difficult because they say, oh, we're not going to give you any money unless you promise us a billion dollar business. You don't need to make a billion dollars to be successful. You know, in New England Biolabs, when we first got started for the first couple of two, three years, we were making a million, two million dollars. That goes an awful long way. You can do a lot with that. And then if you're successful, you can expand and eventually make more money. You don't have to be a, a billion dollar company. And remember, the investors, the investment capital companies and so on that want to put money in, they only want to do it because they think they can take a lot of money out of it at the end. So why not take a small loan or use your savings? Don Combe used his savings to get Biolab started. And it's incredible what you can do, provided you just think, find a good reason for going commercial, and then do it on a small scale and see if it works, and then expand as it works. You don't have to think big all the time. Thinking small is OK, too. There's a question there. Uh Hi, thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk. And I know it's a little late, but congratulations on your Nobel Prize. I was wondering when we can expect the next one. Are you feeling lucky? <laughs> well, to be perfectly honest, I think one is more than enough. OK. You know, this year, the Chemistry Prize winner, Barry Sharpless, um, got a second Nobel Prize. He's only the fourth person in history to get a second Nobel Prize. So. You, you don't need to. One is more than enough, trust me. But again, I would warn, don't make that your ambition in life. Because if you look at almost everybody who's won a Nobel Prize, that's not what they were trying to do. They were doing some science. They made a big discovery by chance. And it turned out to be something that the Nobel Committee eventually recognized. And you don't need a Nobel Prize to be successful and to have a great life. You know, science is such fun to do, and I've always been surprised they pay me to do it. I would do it for nothing. They pay me to do it. It's great. It's lovely. Good career. Yeah. There's a question here. Uh, 
question from our YouTube audience. It says, uh, what would be your take on using phage methylases as antivirals? Well, I think that's not the way you would do it. You could use phages in order to kill bacteria. Okay, but the methylases um, really protect the phages. Um, so I think the most exciting use I've come across of DNA methylases so far can see concerns Clostridium difficile. So C. difficile is something if you go to hospital, there's a good chance you'll get an infection. It's a very common bug in hospitals. And it's very difficult to get rid of. And the reason is because it forms spores. And so with spores, the bacterium sort of forms a little solid body and stops growing. It becomes resistant to antibiotics. It's resistant to anything you do to it. Waits until the antibiotics go away, and then it starts growing again. And so it's really difficult to get rid of it. Well, recently, I mean, in my lab, we discovered a methylase in C. difficile that recognizes C followed by 5A residues. And that methylase controls sporulation. If you knock out that methylase, then C. difficile cannot sporulate anymore. And so there are a couple of places that are now doing clinical trials to see if they've got small molecules that will inhibit this methylase and, and allow it to go. And I mean, I think again about the methylase on phages, they, in principle, get over restriction systems, but there are other systems in bacteria um, that recognize methylation, and we don't always know how they work. So uh, it's possible something can be done in the future. Uh, at the moment, I think we don't yet quite know enough to know how to do that. Are there any further questions? There's one more here. We take the last one. <laughs> it's very pleasant to ask it. And uh, you talked about GM crops, right? Can you speak up a bit. Is the microphone on? Hello. Yeah, now it's clear. Now we can hear In GM crops, um, there can be local uh, ecosystem um, disturbances, right? Should we consider those things? Or, uh, like, are there significant effects of those disturbances while modifying? genes and should we do it accordingly or, or can we not uh, do that it is very random in the nature so i mean you're talking your concern is that by growing gm crops that you're going to affect the ecosystem in some way yeah, not the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. okay but you know, you have exactly the same problem with traditionally bred crops, right? So as soon as I make a cross between two plants that normally grow separately and make a new hybrid that is different, that too can affect the ecosystem. But the nice thing about the GM method is we know exactly what we've done. We know what gene we've put in and we can really monitor, has it gone where we wanted it to? And what are the effects of putting it there? And I think in many ways, the precision approach that GM methods bring allows you to do things in a much more scientific way than traditional plant breeding, which is you know, very much a random hit and miss method. And often these crops turn out not to work very well. So we've had lots of problems over the years with traditionally bred plants. So I'm, I'm less concerned about it. I, I think the GM approach is both sensible, it's scientific, and, you know, look at the Europeans. Do you know what they feed their animals? So they grow calves, they grow sheep so that they can make meat to put in the restaurants. It's almost all GM crops that they import from Brazil, GM soybean, millions of tons every year. The animals eat it. Apparently, this is okay. It's just if humans eat it, it's dangerous. That's crazy. I mean, it's just nonsense. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, so I think that question yes. is answered in that it yes, would be impacting the ecosystem in any case with traditional hybrids right. as well. Thank you so yeah. much. I think we will wrap up now. Is there another question yeah. on YouTube? Uh, whether there was a comment which in some way summarizes the entire talk. Uh, this is uh, from YouTube, uh, Ujula Benedicker. 
Uh, great talk, Sir Richard. She promising your name as well <laughs> as you wanted. The, your journey is very inspiring, especially despite of very negative colleagues you have overcome all the obstacles and persisted with your love for science and discovery. I think that's something which we really thank felt. You. So thank you very much. And we want you to remember this particular lecture. We want to therefore give you a small souvenir. Uh, I'm sure that's something which you will like. I request Vidita to hand over. This. Thank you so much for an absolutely wonderful talk. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I will announce the meeting at 2.30 in yeah. E406. Yeah. Okay, so here is an announcement, uh, especially for the graduate students. Uh, so, uh, Sir Richard is going to meet all the graduate students of the institute in the D406, D block conference room at 2.30. So, I request all of you to assemble a few minutes before 2.30 in D406. Uh, the session will be followed by T right at the venue. So with that, let me once again thank all of you for able to make it. And also, uh, once again, we apologize for starting the clock here a bit late, which as we said, it was a little bit beyond our control. Thank you very much. All the best. Is the thumb drive in here? Did he put? Well, we have to get the USB stick. Is USB stick? Oh, there it is. Can we just take that? Yes.